The Stack. People, business, technology. With Dan Tomaszewski of Everything MSP. Hello, everybody. Dan Tomaszewski here with Everything MSP. Welcome to another episode of The Stack where we focus on people, business, and technology. Today, we are gonna dive into one of those topics that every MSP thinks they've got covered, but maybe, just maybe, not as completely as they should. AV, EDR versus application control. We all know that antivirus and EDR tools are essential, but what happens when something brand new, such as a zero day, slips through without detection? That's where application control comes in. And to unpack this, I've got Deshaun Dorch with me. There we go. We got Deshaun. How you doing? It doing great. Good morning, everybody. Deshaun, uh, Deshaun is from Threat Locker. It's great to have you here. And uh, before we get in and get into all the technical stuff, I'd like to start out with something fun. Um, maybe just get into something that you're into that's non-technical right now. It could be you know a show, uh, could be a hobby, something that. Uh, Something that keeps you occupied. Yeah, um, actually, one of those things is photography. Um, I just went out and got a got a nice camera, did a little upgrade. So I've been trying to travel more, get a little bit outdoorsy. So uh, I know I have a nice digital camera in my hand, but outside of that, breaking out of technology, it's just being a little yeah. bit more outdoors. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, it, you know, it's great that we have hobbies because uh, you know we all need a break. We got to recharge. We got to get our mind off of things other than you know work and cybersecurity. And uh, things like that are great, so I love it. And uh, so let's uh, let's jump into all the good stuff that we're here to talk about. And uh, you know, we we want to have that conversation, you know, and the difference between AV, EDR, and application control. But what I want to do is start out with some of the basics. You know, how does application control differ from AV or EDR, and why should MSPs really care about that distinction? Yeah, well, the difference comes in, I guess, the paradigm of how those solutions block things. And what I mean by that is your your AVs and your EDRs that most people are used to are based off of a list of known bad things, whether it be bad programs or bad behaviors. It's about things that they know shouldn't be running on your machines. Um, now, that is a downfall in itself. The other downfall is that they have to let those bad things run first to know that they're there. Um, I see this bad thing happening. I see this bad thing already here. So now mm -hmm. I'm going to respond or react to it. Um, but nowadays, the malware is so fast that if you let it run first, it's already done something you didn't want it to do. It's already encrypted a file or 100 files, depending on how fast that malware is and how fast your tool responded to it. So uh, allow listing just really shifts that paradigm and says, well, why would I want that stuff to run in the first place to have to respond to it? So instead of building a big list of all the bad guys that you have to constantly update, you just get to build a short list of the things that should be allowed, the known good software in your environment, and that is all that you have to allow to run. Um, malware, ransomware, at the end of the, of the day, is still software. It's just malicious software. It's software you don't want. Um, so that's kind of the difference there. That's how it differs is, again, switching from a list of known bad guys, known bad things that you're looking out for, and switching to something where you're only allowing what you need and nothing else. So you really get, um, you know, I guess the best of both worlds from that perspective, if you, you know, just throwing it in from that angle, um, you know, the fact that it can still, you know, identify those things in real time. But in the end, because of the, you know, the, the potential of it still getting through detection, you're able to just, just to block it out completely. Exactly. And it also helps with things that aren't necessarily going to be detected by an EDR and an AV. Yeah. Um, something like TeamViewer, a remote access tool, uh, benign in and of itself, but it can be used maliciously, um, especially if it doesn't belong in your environment. If you use another remote access tool, TeamViewer shouldn't be there in the first place, possibly. Not to, to throw any dirt on TeamViewer, great tool. Um, but if it's not your tool, it shouldn't be there. And that's something your AV and your EDRs won't detect as malicious. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so when it comes to those zero-day attacks, you know, AV and EDR can 
uh, fall short, you know, just because they do rely on that detection. Uh, so the application control really changes that model completely. So, you know, talk about how this shifts the game for an MSP. Yeah, it really shifts the game. Um, it, it matches the shift kind of in the threat landscape there, where you now have AI that's able to build you malware on demand. Now, it, it doesn't work as easily as just, hey, chat GPT, make me malware. But it's yeah. easy to do for someone who knows how to use those large language models to to have it build them things. Uh, again, ransomware encrypts your data and then effectively moves it somewhere else. That, if you describe it to an, uh, a large language model, doesn't sound malicious. Sure, I'll give you a secure way to encrypt your files and then move them somewhere. That can be created on the spot, zero day, no antivirus or EDR has seen it before because it didn't exist until 20 seconds ago. Um, and previously, these were things that you had to look out for those real knowledgeable threat actors, these nation states, these, these higher up threat actors. Um, nowadays, it's, it's high school kids, script kiddies that can just get online and again, ask the internet for effective malware. So um, allow listing again, just changes the game where all of that software, zero day or not, it is still something that was not on your allow list. So it just doesn't get to run. Yeah, and you know, and you said it so perfectly as far as how AI uh, is really having such a huge impact. And uh, I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember, you know, when the internet came out, and you know, and all the moms and dads are, oh, because of the internet, you know, all these bad things. You know, it's meant to be a good tool, but it, of course, can be used in a bad way, much like AI. And you know, as you mentioned, you know, the the tools that are out there, whether it be ChatGPT or Gemini you know, just natively typing in a thing saying, create me malware, create me some kind of a threat, you know, won't do it, but it's how they get around it, right? You know, and it's how they, you know, uh, you know, manipulate those prompts to be able to come up with something. And, you know, they're still able to use it and leverage those tools. And, uh, and I think that's the, the biggest game changer is that, you know, as an MSP, you know, those bad actors are continuing to leverage, you know, technology to do harm, now we need to continue to leverage technology to be able to secure our clients, right? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that I, I keep hearing MSPs worry about is, you know, deployment, end user friction. You know, we all are, you know, very conscientious of, you know, what kind of impact is it gonna have on our end user? You know, we do know that we want to be able to have a smooth, um, you know, and in, in just a, a natural, uh, you know, I guess, a, a use of the technology for our, our clients, for the end users. However, we do know that there are some hoops that we have to jump through um, to protect them. So Brad Walker has something that's called learning mode, and I'd love to have you walk us through you know, what that is and, uh, you know, and how that makes the rollout easier for MSPs. Yeah, absolutely. Learning mode is an incredible tool and an incredible way to get into zero trust. Um, we didn't invent zero trust. A allow listing had been around in certain environments, but it was typically restricted to environments that didn't change much because how hard it was to implement zero trust. Um, previously, admins had to go in and capture all of the files that made up every application in a very manual way. They had to go and grab all the, the hashes or the fingerprints of files to define an application and then say, this, as it is right now, is allowed to run uh, and allowed to continue to run. And that would work well for environments that didn't change. So, I mean, your, your nuclear power plant that had a program that always just made the power plant run. It didn't change, didn't need updates, air gap system, um, it, it, it would work there. It would fail when you started introducing it to users, um, when, when MSPs and enterprise would take it to, enter, to environments that needed to change. We had software that needs to update. Your Google Chromes, your, your Microsoft Offices, um, even your operating systems, they do need to be able to change. And that was something those tools didn't really allow for. Um, so what learning mode did is it went in and said, don't worry about you sending your text to go in and capture all of these files. We'll do that for you. We will go in and scan your environment. We'll detect the software that you already need and trust in your environment, and we'll automatically allow it to run. Um, and that's good, but where the real power was is in the future proofing, where learning mode would go in automatically, and they would, one, deploy built-ins. Um, built-ins are our definitions of apps that our application team 
manages for you. So we don't have to learn that much once we know the application exists. But even for ones that we don't support with built-ins, we would go in and say, I want to build a rule that securely allows this application to both run and change in the future. Um, so largely rules based on paths and certificates or processes and certificates, as long as the vendor is still validly signing, signing these files, we know that they can change. Uh, and then of course you have your solution, solutions engineer that works with you just to help refine some of those rules and make even better rules so that by the time you're ready to secure, we know that your software is allowed to run now and in the future with little to no touches by you and your team. So, I mean, let's talk about the, you know, how this helps with the end user experience, because, you know, essentially without learning mode, you know, if you were to deploy it and everything is live, um, it could cause some friction, right? Exactly. So, so you go in with great intentions. I'm deploying a, a new security tool to keep you safe. Um, but then if that, that tool doesn't allow something as simple as an application to update, and then yeah. when an application does update, it breaks. Now the end users are mad. Hey, you just deployed this new security tool, um, but now you're breaking my productivity software. I can't work because I'm more secure. Um, yeah. So that, that's yeah. definitely a friction point that we want to make sure you're not dealing with. Yeah, no, that's great. I think it makes a, a night and day difference, um, you know, for that end user experience. And, you know, and, and, and the thing is, um, you know, you, you bring up, uh, you know, because I'm more secure and that's totally right. I mean, nobody likes, uh, you know, two factor, um, but we do know that is a hoop we have to jump through, um, you know, but in this case, you know, we're doing something behind the scenes, you know, before it, it even has any impact on it. So, I, you know, I, I love that and uh, clearly has a, a huge benefit to all of our end users. Um, you know, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, control. Um, you know, what does it really mean for an MSP to have complete control over it? every piece of software running on a client's machine and, you know, what kind of visibility and peace of mind, you know, does that bring? Yeah. So I think that goes back to the example earlier with team viewer, not being a malicious piece of software, but just being able to control the approved tools down to things like the web browsers. Uh, again, there's, there's many different web browsers. There's not many that I would say are malicious, but again, you get the choice. We only allow, edge in this environment if we want to. And then even speaking of web browsers, um, the extensions, that is a, is a big point of contention with a lot of companies. So again, just giving you control over what your users are allowed to run or have on their machines. Um, I've seen this be a big help in things like schools or other environments where you have to deploy laptops, maybe temporarily, one user gets it for a certain amount of time. Previously before Threat Locker, you would give it to a user they would have just unlimited reign over what they put on that machine. So by the time the IT admin got back, they may as well just go ahead and re-image the machine because there's so much bloatware, junk they've installed, extensions, maybe a virus or two, all this stuff. So it's a lot more work in the end to have to clean these computers off. Whereas with Threat Locker, you go on and say, they can install the web browser, this application they need for work, which is the same set of applications the next person will need for work. Now you're not as worried about junk being on that machine. You're not spending as much time refreshing and cleaning up these machines because they've never changed from the baseline because you didn't allow them to. So lots of different benefits there just in having that complete control versus only detecting known malicious items. Yeah, you know, so, um... You know, when, when you take a look at MSPs, a lot of them already have a solid AV and EDR stack. Uh, so when you take a look at adding a layer of application control into the existing setup, um, uh, you know, how how can this be done without creating extra work or headaches for their team? Yeah, it, it gives you less work, honestly. Um, there's less change that you have to manage when at the beginning, you set the stage for what's allowed in that environment. You're not responding to something that your AV or EDR cleaned up a little bit after it executed. Um, you're not responding to someone, uh, a change in the environment, installing apps that need to be uninstalled. Um, everything is just how you have it. So then it ends up being a lot less work after you've deployed a zero trust control system. Gotcha. Um, you know, so for any of our audience that wants to, you know, Give Threat Locker a try. 
Um, you guys have a free demo. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? Yeah, so the demo is going to be great. Um, you just schedule that call. You'll get on with a sales rep and an engineer like myself or one of the members of my team here. They'll walk you through all of the zero trust controls that ThreatLocker has to offer because today we focus mainly on allow listing, but ThreatLocker is an entire zero trust platform. So uh, we have modules that span across network zero controls, storage uh, zero trust controls, your cloud zero trust controls with Microsoft 365. So lots of different avenues where we can kind of deploy zero trust into your environment. So definitely work scheduling a call, taking a look at all that we have to offer. Excellent. And you guys do have a free demo available and we're going to uh, throw into the show notes a link for you to be able to get access to that free demo. Um, you know, and with that being said, Deshaun, this has been very insightful. I want to thank you so much for all of your time. Um, any parting words before we uh, close out? Yeah, everybody just stay safe out there. Um, zero trust is the way to go in my humble opinion. So again, come have a look, see what we can offer you. And I think we'll find a good fit in your environment. Awesome. All right, Deshaun, thank you so much for all of our audience. Thank you for listening to us again today. Until next time, we will see you soon. Take care, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening to The Stack. 